I have a confession to make. I'm a little bit of an adventure junkie. There's something about looking a new challenge right in the eye and wondering, can I do it? That mix of curiosity and fear. I call that aliveness. And it was a recent adventure that I took that took me into some unexpected places. You see, I decided to sign up for a 200-hour yoga teacher training program. Yeah, woohoo, yay. <laughs> I knew I would be challenged physically because, quite frankly, I'm not that bendy. So touching my toes is hard on some days. I wasn't quite sure how I would work in headstands and backbends, but I was willing to take the challenge. And I knew I would be challenged mentally because we had to memorize Sanskrit terms and study ancient yoga texts to understand the philosophy behind yoga. What I didn't expect was to be so challenged emotionally. There were a lot of days I ended up crying in down dog on my mat. <laughs> but it wasn't an entirely unfamiliar feeling either. Because it made me look back at all the little adventures I've taken and realize that I was on a journey all along to discover my inner leader. Because I believe we're all on a journey. And while the outer journeys that we take may determine what communities we become part of or what other people think of us, it's the inner journey that determines what we think of ourselves. And there's one small belief that I think if we could just flip it around, could change everything. And that's the belief that the environment has to be safe before we can be who we really are. How many people have thought that if the environment was a little safer, I might speak up? Well, here's what I've learned on my inner journey to leadership. Speaking up makes the environment safe. The environment adapts to you. It's our job to speak up and see what happens. Now, I wasn't always willing to speak up. And I can trace that back to an incident that happened when I was in the Army. I was a brand new lieutenant, fresh out of West Point. I like two things, to look good and get it right. <laughs> so, yeah. so when I showed up at flight school, I was ready to kick butt and take names because that's the kind of girl I was. So when I failed my first check ride, which is an assessment of how your skills and abilities are progressing in the cockpit, I was mortified. I'm not the kind of girl who fails. When I failed my second check ride, I was mortified and terrified because I had to go stand in front of a lieutenant colonel and hear him say whether or not I got to stay in flight school. I still shake thinking about that day, standing at attention in front of his desk because I hadn't slept very well the night before. And I could feel my stomach churning, wondering what the outcome would be. And I could feel the sweat dripping down my back and <laughs> there was no moisture in my mouth. I sure hoped you wouldn't ask me to speak because I don't know what I would say. And seconds felt like hours as he flipped through my file looking for some indication about whether or not I was good enough. And when he finally spoke, I wasn't sure I wanted to hear what he had to say. Lieutenant Stein, I've decided to let you stay in flight school. I mean, you can imagine the relief, right? That fear that I was going to have to call everyone I knew and tell them I couldn't cut it, that I had failed out, that was gone. And a sense of peace returned, and my heart returned to a normal rate, and there was moisture in my mouth again. <laughs> and I was so happy that probably why what he said next was such a blow to the gut. Because I didn't see it coming after he said that I could stay when he leaned across his desk and said, I sure feel sorry for the unit that gets you because you're a liability, not an asset. Now get out of my office. I didn't quite know what to do with that. I'm a liability, but you're gonna send me back out into the army to fly helicopters? Is that a good idea? Well, I don't know how not to be me, and he didn't say part of me was a liability. So I guess I should figure out how to be someone else. What are the assets doing? Let me look around and imitate those guys, the ones getting the, the good assessments, the high evaluation marks. Let me be like that. Shouldn't be too hard. We have some qualities in common, right? 
I'm competitive, I'm assertive, I get things done, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. Maybe it's the things I do that they're not doing that need to stop. I'm kind of a goofball, I don't take things very seriously most of the time, and that doesn't seem to be very appreciated, so I should probably tuck that away and stop doing that. And I'm kind of compassionate and have sympathy for people going through hard times, but this looks like a tough love environment. So maybe the compassion should get tucked away too. Now I went out and I finished flight school. I graduated, got my first choice of aircraft. I showed up at my first assignment, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, ready to fly Chinook helicopters. Be tough. And there were days that compassion and that sympathy screamed to get out, but I wouldn't let it. Because I had this tape in my head saying, I'm a liability, I'm a liability, I'm a liability. Even on the day when my platoon sergeant and I got notice that one of our soldiers had lost his father to a sudden unexpected heart attack. It was our job to deliver the news. We called him into the office, which is already terrifying enough, kind of like being called to the principal's office when you don't know what you've done wrong. And I looked at his eyes wide open and his jaw clenched, and I thought I should probably let my platoon sergeant handle this. Since I'm a liability, I'll just step back and let her take care of delivering the news. Now, I don't know exactly how you deliver that kind of news to someone, but growing up with a mother who was a social worker, I knew you kind of eased people into it. Have you called home recently? Have you talked to your family? Why don't you sit down while we talk about the news we have to share? So as I stood in the corner trying to mentally prepare to be part of this conversation, I took a deep breath, and before I could exhale, I heard my platoon sergeant saying, there's no easy way to say this. Your father is dead. Is that how assets deliver tough news? I thought I could do better, but since I was a li liability, I decided not to speak up. And I didn't speak up a lot during the seven years I was in the Army. It wasn't until the last six months of my time in the Army when I decided I would try something I had never tried before, to be me. <laughs> because frankly, at that point, I didn't have to hide the fact I was getting out. The paperwork was approved, everyone knew it, so I should just give it a go, right? So I turned my office into this kind of little sanctuary. Because by that point, I was a captain. I was in charge of the administrative pay actions, the awards that people would get in our unit, and the notifications when things went wrong at home. And I didn't just have 20 or 30 people to take care of. I had 650 people to take care of. And I sure as heck wasn't going to let the same thing happen that I saw happen to that other soldier in my first assignment. So I put copies of People magazine on my desk and a teapot <laughs> and snacks. There were fresh flowers every week and inspirational quotes up on the wall. I wanted it to be a fun place, a safe place. I even started taking a hot pink notebook to command and staff meetings. <laughs> The colonel just shook his head because he had seven daughters. So he got it, but he didn't really get it, right? <laughs> now, you remember my record with lieutenant colonels based on that guy from flight school. So I don't know what got into me the day that the lieutenant colonel who commanded my last unit walked in and said, Captain Stein, I have an idea I want to run past you. Blah, 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 what do you think? I don't know if it was the candy and the snacks, the People magazine. <laughs> or the flowers and the inspirational quotes, but I told him exactly what I thought. Whoa, sir, that is a big mistake. This is the wrong person to handle that part, and these things don't go together at all. And logistically, some things need to switch around. What is happening to his face? <laughs> you see, as I, as I talked to him, I saw his eyebrow going up and his head sort of tilting to the side and his jaw dropping, and I thought to myself, Oh no, <laughs> because I'm getting out of the army, but I'm not out yet, and I still technically fall under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which means I should probably not be back-talking a colonel. So I return to that familiar position of attention, stomach churning, sweat dripping, moisture gone. Seconds felt like hours as I saw him take two very deliberate steps toward me and lean in to say something. And just like the lieutenant colonel in flight school, what he said next 
shocked me. Tell me more. That sounded an awful lot like he just said, tell me more. Do you want to hear what I have to say? <laughs> Is this what it feels like to be an asset? <laughs> Am I an asset? <laughs> oh no, I've already put my paperwork in to leave. But when I put that paperwork in, it was a stifling, oppressive environment where it wasn't safe to be me. And now, now there's flowers and candy <laughs> and fun and openness and honesty and a dialogue. I get to share my ideas. Should I be leaving when the environment is making changes for the better? Or was the environment changing at all? Had I been the one to change? Ultimately, I decided it was time for me to get out of the Army and move on to a new adventure, corporate America. In every job, I seemed to quickly become the girl who people would lean over and say to during meetings, I cannot believe you just said that to your boss. <laughs> but I couldn't believe how much wasn't being said to bosses. Yes, they have titles, but do they know everything? So many of us are sitting on the sidelines with valuable information, precious insights, and experiences that only we can share. And we're waiting for the invitation that's not on the way, <laughs> right? It's our job to share those pieces of insight because most of the time those bosses and those people with the titles don't know you have information that's important. So eventually I outgrew the corporate environment too and set off on another adventure called entrepreneurship. I decided to become a professional facilitator. Facilitation comes from the Latin facile, which means to make easy. And what I try to make easy for people is those conversations that need to happen. The ones where the environment just needs a little tweaking to feel safe so they can speak up. And one of my favorite things to do as a facilitator is train other facilitators. To go out and help people see that I'm not magic, there's nothing crazy in what I'm doing. All I'm doing is being honest, maybe a little vulnerable, saying those things that need to be said that are a little hard to say. And I was teaching a class one time, it's a four-day class called the Effective Facilitator, where there's three days of material and one day of practical exercises. And I woke up on the fourth day of that, that class and I thought, this particular group needs a little something extra. We've been talking all week about being a superhero using your powers for good, creating a justice league by getting everybody to be honest and contribute. There's no one leader, everybody's a leader. And even though we've had great conversations, I don't know that I've demonstrated it very well. But I have this Wonder Woman outfit in my suitcase. <laughs> it's a whole nother TED talk. <laughs> I think I have to wear that in front of them. Now, it didn't seem like a particularly brilliant idea, but it felt necessary. Stomach churning, sweat dripping, you get the idea. I knew something was about to happen. And so I showed up ready to give that morning pep talk with my Wonder Woman running outfit. Just to be clear, a running skirt is not the same length as a corporate skirt, okay? <laughs> and I wasn't sure I would have the guts to, to do it. But as I started talking to them, I got real excited. I'm like, guys, take a risk. Don't play it safe. You've been learning for three days and there's new material that you're dying to try. But there's a piece of you that wants to look good and get it right. Ditch those pieces. Take the risk. Call us forth. Have us discover something new. If you fall on your face, we will applaud the effort and you will leave a stronger facilitator. And as I was talking, clothes were flying off. And before I knew it, I was standing there in my Wonder Woman outfit. <laughs> Breeze flapping in my cape. <laughs> and no one was saying a word. Well, this is awkward. <laughs> Especially because it wasn't my material I was teaching. I was there representing someone else. How would he feel about my choice of outfits? And as I saw a student reach for her phone, I thought this can only go one of two ways. <laughs> She'll post these photos and I will either be thought of as an epic, inspirational genius or that idiot who stripped down to a Wonder Woman outfit in corporate America. But in that moment, I believed in what I was doing, and I was willing for either outcome to happen. 
because I was being honest with myself, I was following my instincts, and I was being authentically who I was. So I said, go ahead, take your pictures. <laughs> click, 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 click. It was Wonder Woman paparazzi up in there for a few minutes. They went on to absolutely blow me away, hands down, the best presentations or facilitated sessions I had ever seen on a final day. They also blew me away with the evaluations. Every single person gave the experience and me as a facilitator a 10 out of 10. That had never happened before and it has not happened since. People like to say, oh, you should do that Wonder Woman stunt again, but once it's a stunt and you know how it turns out, it's not risky anymore. There's a vulnerability to taking risk. And her, her research on wholehearted living, Brene Brown, talks about vulnerability. When other people do it, it's inspiring and it looks like strength. When we do it, it's scary and it feels like weakness. But my hope for you as you leave here today is that you understand there's no way to make the environment safe. How do you think the call would have gone if I said, hey, head office, I have this idea about stripping down to a Wonder Woman outfit in front of your corporate client. I have a gut feeling. I promise it'll work. Right? Not a chance. And sometimes we wait so long for that approval outside that we forget to have the dialogue inside that should go a little something like this. I am an asset. What I know matters. And when I authentically act in service of other people, the environment is very forgiving. So as you leave here today, remember that. You are an asset. And when you're ready to step to that ragged edge and put your toes right over, the environment will adapt. Thank you.